you have a lot of debt, Alo? Is that question too personal for the start of a podcast? Uh, that depends on what you mean by debt. Do you, do you own a lot of equity, Matt? I have no idea what you're talking about. If only there was a podcast that would explain these things. Uh, but maybe we could do one. We work at a bank, after all. Hmm. What should we call it? How about a dictionary of finance? Okay. Finance fans, cinch up your Hermes ties and slip on your Prada loafers. Let's do this. This is a Dictionary of Finance. I'm Matt, and I'm here in beautiful Luxembourg with my colleague Alar. Alar and I work for the European Investment Bank, the EU's bank. But we're not bankers. No, we're not. And because I'm not actually a banker, Matt, I often run into strange technical terms and phrases every day here. And when I'm, uh, when I'm talking to people, I don't always know what, what they're talking about. So I would like to find out. Well, don't worry, Allah. We've got lots of experts in finance at the European Investment Bank. Two of them are here today. And yes, they're looking at me as if to say me, an expert, but yes, they are. They're going to explain to us what some of these puzzling, complicated phrases really mean. So if you're a student, or if you run a business, or if you'd like to understand what politicians are talking about when they talk about the economy, then subscribe to this podcast, and before you know it, you'll be a bit of an expert yourself. So this episode is about equity and debt. To tell us what these terms mean and to give us a few examples of how they work, we're joined by Angus McRae and Kristen Lang. Angus works in the European Investment Bank's equity, new products and special transactions area. We're rather lucky to have Angus here. His official title is managerial advisor. Uh, so usually he's advising managers at the bank, uh, but today he's advising you, dear listener. And Kristen Lang is head of the European Investment Bank's International Banks Division for the Central and Southeastern Europe. Banks and banks. Sounds like she knows a bit about banks. She does. Angus, we're dealing with uh, relatively basic finance terms on this episode of the podcast. So let's start with a basic question. What is equity? Equity is uh, often, often described as shares. Uh, and what this means is... Uh, that you're owning a, a share in the company. So uh, if you uh, distinguish between companies raising equity and raising debt, uh, equity uh, is, is the part uh, which bears all of the risk uh, and consequently allows you to have all of the upside if everything goes well. Uh, and debt uh, is a, a fixed obligation to repay money which, uh, which you borrow. But how, how much do you have to pay if you want a share of a company? Let's say a company is worth a certain amount. Do they always sell the same number of shares? Or how do they figure these things out? Uh, the, the calculation that you, that you have to do is, is simply uh, the value of the company divided by the number of shares that you issue. So if you have a company which is worth a thousand pounds, or I'm sorry, a thousand euros, <laughs> and uh, uh, you issue shares, then uh, you could issue a thousand shares, in which case the shares would be worth a pound each, or you could issue 10,000 shares, in which case the shares would be worth 10 cents each. But these days, the, the shares, they don't have a physical manifestation anymore. It's not like in the movies where you discover an old trunk in, in, uh, in your grandmother's um, room where, where you find these nice little pieces of paper that say you actually own a valuable part of you know, Ford or something. That's correct. They've dematerialized the, the shares such that you don't have to have the actual physical document. We have to have an anymore. episode of the podcast on that phrase, dematerialize. <laughs> With that, but what Angus is referring to is when you're in the primary market issuing... Oh, hold on, hold on. Primary market. We're, we're getting very, way too complicated here. Um, so that, yeah. before raising capital, you have shares. If you start a company, you automatically have 100% of the company in shares belonging to people who founded it, right? Is that correct? Yes, that's for, for, for a private... If, if I were to set up a company, uh, I could put in 1,000 uh, euros... Uh, and award myself a thousand shares or ten thousand shares. Uh, as the company grows, I may want to encourage other people to invest in my company. In other words, to give me money for a part of that company. Uh, and eventually, if the if the company really is successful, uh, 
then I might want to list the company. In other words, to go out to the general public and sell shares in the in the company to the general public. And then there would be what's called a primary listing. So if you start with that 1,000 euros, why would you want to sell shares? And would you want it so that, let's say, Kristen will give you some money for one of those shares and you go off and, and buy a BMW? Or do you, do, you, do you sell a part of the company in order to do something in particular? Well, normally when you're starting a company, you need to invest in order to get the company to grow. So if you're opening um, uh, hairdressers, you need to buy the equipment, you need to, to lease the shop, you need to employ people to cut people's hair. So you would sell shares in your company to get the money and then put that back into the company. Uh, and if things go well, then you would receive money from your clients and your company would become more valuable so that your shares would go up or be worth more. Mm-hmm. But how do you decide how much you can sell it for or how much, let's say, that Kristen would, would pay to have a part of that? Well, when, you're, when you have a small company, essentially you go around to... I mean, normally you talk about the three Fs, which are friends, family and fools, <laughs> and you convince them that you have a great idea and you're going to make tons and tons of money in the future, but you just need some now in, in order to be able to, to get things started. And that share that they buy, hopefully, uh, uh, will then bring them a yearly dividend of the profits that your company hopefully will make, correct? I think hopefully is a good word, yes. It, it, I think once, once a company starts making more money than it's investing, then it, it can pay out dividends to its shareholders. But a company doesn't have to pay dividends in order to be considered valuable. So a company like Google, for instance, considers that it's investing so much money so well that it shouldn't waste it by paying it out to shareholders. Uh, it simply reinvests the money and the shares continue to grow in value. So it's, so it's worth for me to have that share just because the, the value of that share is going to grow over time and in the future I may be, it may be able to sell it for more than that one pound that I put in in the beginning. Yes, that's right. I mean, that's why the word share, it's useful to think of the word share as share of the company. Provided the company becomes more valuable, then your share of the company also becomes more valuable. Are there different kinds of shares? Yes, I mean, there's different shares based on uh, voting rights. So you could have a situation where someone is willing to take in the money, but they still want the control, and so they will limit the voting rights of the different share classes. Voting on, on what? For example, if you're going to pay a dividend. Uh, mm-hmm. So in uh-huh. terms of what, what the company is going to do. So you have people who are, let's say, uh, starting off very small and are quite interested in maintaining uh, control and not having an outsider come in and change the focus of a company. Okay. But, but when banks... Um, uh, do, so banks invest in shares in, in equity? All sorts of financial institutions invest in shares. Banks may do, uh, pension funds invest in shares, individuals invest in shares. In essence, the, the, the whole of our economy uh, is, is powered by people deciding that it's a good idea to uh, invest, in inverted commas, in, in companies in, in order to make them grow uh, and do things which are, which are generally deemed to be useful. So if you have a hairdressing salon, let's say, you can sell shares in that business. But how big do you have to be before you, you can sell a share on the, on the stock exchange? Most countries have a stock exchange. And, and clearly, the, the constraint is uh, the uh, expense in listing a share on a stock exchange. In other words, you have to employ investment bankers and lawyers and accountants in order to make sure that you produce... Uh, offer documents which, uh, which properly represent the company, it's an expensive business. So uh, I couldn't give you a number for how much it costs to list on the New York Stock Exchange or the, uh, the London Stock Exchange, but, but we're, I mean, we're talking about um, uh, you know, beyond 50 or 100 million uh, euros. Mm-hmm. But stock exchange, I, I used to work uh, in Africa, and in fact, uh, we are the size of some of the stock exchanges in Africa, where they would just come and meet around a table, 
and uh, then there would be a discussion between the, the two brokers that existed in the country, and uh, they would uh, exchange the certificates, or later on, uh, when it was dematerialized, register the changes in ownership, and, and, and that was that. So it's evolved from the, you know, the very tiny meeting place uh, to now where everything is electronic. So it's also become cheaper for companies to, to be listed and to, to, to be in, in involved in that exchange of shares? The, I mean, there's, there's a trade-off always bet between how easy and how cheap it is to do things and the level of uh, investor protection that you get. In other words, how sure you can be when you buy a piece of paper from a stranger, essentially, in a company that you don't really know, that the, the, the person is representing what is really true. So at one level, two people can get together over a coffee table uh, and you know, trade bits of paper, and that is you know, originally what the stock exchange was. Uh, nowadays, when you're dealing with people that you don't know and, and you know, the market is much, much bigger, there are, there are lots more hoops to jump through in order to make sure there are protections for, for, for you and me. And there's obligations. So in terms of the company, it's not just a matter of going through the hoops to get listed. You, know, you have ongoing obligations of reporting that if you were not listed, you would not necessarily have to have the same level of auditors involved and lawyers. And the legal expenses can be quite, quite significant. But what about the obligations to a shareholder? So if I own a share, is that just, you know, I put up a certain amount of cash and get rights to future dividends or, or the, f the future rise in the share value? Or do I, do I have to take on ongoing obligations for that company in the future? So the key is that your, your liability, in other words, how much somebody can come and ask you for in terms of money, is limited to the amount that you have bought the share for. So if you, if you buy a share in a truly terrible investment proposition, um, and you know, uh, let's imagine it's a nuclear power station which has a, a terrible catastrophic accident, you will lose all of your money that you invested in the company. So a share that was worth 100 will be worth precisely zero. But you will not lose any more than that. So you will not be liable for all of the cleanup and the expenses incurred uh, as a result of that. And, and that is why people are prepared to invest in relatively risky ventures by buying shares, because they know that they can lose the amount that they put in, but no more than that. Going back to the voting rights, so when a bank invests in shares or a financial institution does does that bank suddenly start telling that hairdresser how to run that business do do banks do that do they get involved in in how 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 the how the companies are I think the run? activist shareholders uh, are, aren't necessarily the banks that are going to take on that role it's generally you have certain individuals with an agenda that they want to change the direction of a company and when you have the shareholders meeting, they can try to, how could we say, influence the results such that, uh, for example, they decide that you're no longer going to, you, they're not going to endorse you being chairman, that they want to bring in someone else who is more in line with what their objectives are in the company. But banks wouldn't do that. Banks generally don't play an activist role uh, in terms of the shareholding structure. Well, that's how it works. You have a shareholders meeting. Everybody who has shares <coughs> is entitled to go to this meeting what do they do there? Do they, do they say to the chairman, I like you, I don't like you? How does it work? Does the chairman have to propose what they're going to do with the company for the next year or so? How does it work? I've never been to a shareholders meeting, but you, know, you receive you know, the agenda of what is going to be and you have the voting and such. And I've seen you know, the, the you know, cases like Apple where it seems that their shareholder meetings, to Steve Jobs was quite entertaining um, with that. So I think it, it depends on the, the, the company of what level of detail they go, they go into. But the most important thing is approving the accounts and approving you know, who's going to be running the company. I heard sometimes you get free stuff. Like if you, if you invest in a, in a company producing um, uh, food stuff, you go, you go there, you, you get to sample the products. I mean, it's, it's, it's nice. It's sometimes really entertaining. Free stuff is definitely entertaining. Well, this podcast is free, so I hope that's entertaining too. So let's, let's go on to what's, what is debt, because that's the, the other term, and it's a sort of a, a counterpart to equity. So what is debt? Well, Angus decided, described the situation where you have a, a company that is issuing equity. Well, the company also has another choice. 
And that is if it's large enough that it has uh, a credible cash flow, so meaning that what it's doing is earning money such that a bank is willing to take the risk in loaning money, then the, the company will take on debt. Now, with this, there are certain obligations. It's not like the case of, of equity where you can have a choice whether you're going to pay a dividend or not. In the case of a loan, you actually have a schedule where you have to pay interest and repay the the principal amount of, of the debt. So, so um, issuing debt is riskier for a company? Well, I think that the, the issue is what is the level of risk that the, the person providing uh, the cash is willing to take. So in the, the case of startup companies, a bank may not see that there's really a cash flow such that if we lend the money that they're actually going to be able to repay uh, in the uh, accordance with the schedule, so they may prefer to or have no choice but equity. But once the company is strong enough and is viewed as what we say bankable, meaning that you, they say that the credit risk is such that they deem that this person is going to pay back the loan, or they may have uh, what we what we call collateral, such that you know someone is uh, signing over their house uh, in the event that they are unable to pay, that the bank can go in. Uh, and foreclose on a house, or maybe someone has uh, bonds or something, personal assets that they're willing to put forward. But but which is cheaper for a company? So w is it is it cheaper to to take out a loan, or is it cheaper to sell shares? Well, I think you have to look at the long term perspective uh, of the of the company. Uh, it, it could be at, at the the beginning stage that by issuing equity. They don't have the obligation to pay a dividend to start out with. But if your growth potential is significant, in fact, it would have ended up being quite costly having issued the, that equity because you as an individual would have preferred to have 100% ownership uh, rather than the person who bought the shares having ownership in your company. So it all depends, I think, on your perspectives of growth. But the good thing about debt is that the investor or the bank providing that money to a company, they won't have a... Uh, the option of getting involved in my business, right? No, they will not get involved in your business, and they don't get the upside. It's quite contained. You know what what you're going to have to pay. When you see upside is yes. sorry, you used a term that I don't know. So well, in terms of, so. if we're, we're talking about the growth of the company, so we're talking about let's say that the, the Angus's hairdresser uh, has growing, so they have grown international, and that they have you know opened up boutiques all over the world and such. You know, it will have expanded in the value from when initially someone put in the, the, the one uh, okay. pound. And the debt provider would receive no benefits from that. They would still be getting the, the couple of percent that They would get the interest, the, the interest and the interest schedule that was agreed to. So, so you could have a debt from Shea Angus, the, the hairdresser, but they're not, they're also governments issue debt. What, why did governments issue debt? And what do they issue? How do you buy it. So governments issue debt uh, as part of uh, the way in which they, money, they manage the budget that they have. Just like you and I, they get money in through taxes uh, and they have to spend money on you know, education and, and health care and, uh, and the like. And in order to smooth their, their budget, they will borrow money uh, on uh, the uh, international markets. And, and what this means is they will simply say, we would like to borrow 100 million euros. We will pay this money back over either a year or five years or 10 years. Uh, and in addition, we will, we will pay uh, a certain amount of interest on the money that we, uh, that we borrow. And the idea behind that is that the money that they think they can uh, spend now will create enough dividends uh, in a broader sense to the country over the next couple of years to make it worthwhile paying back the interest. But why do they why do they why can't they just spend the money that they get from taxes? Well, I think that you know you need to look at monetary policy. So it's when you're talking about a country, it's very different than a company. So in terms of the actions of a government could be that they're trying to combat inflation, they're trying to take money out out of the supply. So if you're buying the if you're buying the bonds that are issued you're taking money away from people. So instead of going out and you know buying uh, consumption goods, you have given the money to the government in the form of bonds. So it's a way that they're 
trying to, one, have a source of finance, and second, uh, trying to enact their monetary policy, whether they want to increase or decrease the money supply. So if you want to buy debt, you buy a bond, right? If you want to buy equity, you buy a share, but if you want to buy debt, you buy a bond. What, what are they dematerialized? Yes, they are I mean, dematerialized. They are dematerialized, and they also uh, can be traded on, on, on stock exchange. Why would you buy, let's say you're an investor, why would you buy a bond rather than equity? Let's say Angus's hairdresser has issued equity, but it's also issued a bond. Why would you buy one rather than the other? I think it, it looks at your risk profile. So what, what is your time horizon? So when do you, when do you need the money back? Okay. And what happens if you don't get the money back? Hmm. So if you are near retirement, I think you know investing in Angus's hair salon uh, is probably not the best Best use of a. It's a lovely haircut. Idea. <laughs> idea. It's got a lovely haircut. Um, That's true. You know, I would I would buy the German the German buns rather than. Uh, but but gen- generally speaking, mm-hmm. sorry, mm-hmm. If, if if you're thinking about whether to buy a share or a bond in the same company, mm-hmm. the, the assumption is that the share will pay out a higher uh, level of dividend, but is riskier, and the bond will pay out a, a lower level of interest, but is less risky. And, and the bond payment will be regular, and it's something that's pretty much assured. And, and, and uh, uh, the share might not pay a dividend next year if the shareholders decide not to, and it might go down in value. Yeah, that's right. If, th- if things go badly, then the dividend is the first thing to go, but the interest on, on the debt will still be paid by the company. And if things go really badly, and the company... Uh, needs to be wound up, in other words, everything needs to be sold in, in, in order to pay people off, then the bondholders will get their money before, before the shareholders. So the shareholders will be at the bottom of the pile. How do you know what's risky about a bond? Is there something that tells you? You know, the, perhaps the rating or something like that that tells you this is a risky bond to invest in, this is a solid bond if you're, if you're retiring by this one, if you're well, in terms of you have the, the ratings that are like by the rating agencies. So, for example, the EIB issues bonds that are AAA rated. So that's the highest uh, highest rating. So in terms of that, if, if you're looking for just a, a way of deciding uh, the level of risk, you can look at the rating. And then there's what they call junk bond. What is what is that? That's That's, I guess, the lowest rated bond. Yes, the ratings go from uh, treble A, which is which is the safest, uh, all the way down, I think, to treble C, which is essentially in default. Uh, if you go below uh, treble B minus, so for instance, you may have heard in the news recently that South Africa was downgraded to junk status. What that means is they were rated, uh, I think, double B by the rating agencies. That That doesn't mean anything special, it, it just means that it's going to be more expensive for the South African government to, to raise debt because people think that there's a high a higher chance that they may not be able to, to repay on their own. So they have to offer you a higher rate of interest. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So it's it's called junk because it's 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 like junk food. It's it's a little bit more fun immediately, but you may pay the price later. That's exactly what it's like. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Good. Good. Everything comes back to the, the tummy in the end. So <clears throat> the debt ratings, then, that's, that's how you could decide you know, if, if this is a, a risky thing or not. What happens if, let's say, the economy is doing well? What happens to a share and what happens to a bond? Do they respond in the same way? Generally speaking, if the economy is, is doing well, I would say that, that shares tend to perform well because... You know, my hairdresser business will be booming. I'll be getting lots of people through the door, making money and, and paying a dividend. The, if that same hairdresser had, had issued debt, they'll still be repaying the same level of interest that they agreed at the same time. There's probably less chance of there being a default, of them not paying. So if it was a bond which had been issued and priced, then, then the price of that bond would go up a little bit but probably less than the value of the shares. Uh, but you, you mentioned EIB issuing bonds. So, okay, EIB is a different kind of bank, but normal banks issue debt. Why would a bank need to issue debt? I mean, they get money from people in the street uh, 
putting putting money in the bank. Well, in terms of a bank, has many different ways of of, of funding themselves. The EIB is not a good example. Uh, it's not a normal bank um, uh, with that. So we have to issue bonds in order to have the the money in order to invest in projects. But a normal bank, they could have the deposits that clientele is a is having confidence to deposit in their institution. They could uh, ha want to have, let's say, longer-term sources of finance, because one of the problems with deposits is you don't know how long the person's going to keep them there. So they may want to have some sort of uh, longer-term uh, debt so they at least can, if you want to give a, a loan to someone to buy a house, you, you, you need to be able to finance that through long-term deposits and not just the short-term the short term to balance. So you have to balance the two sides of the, the balance sheet uh, with it. So one is you can have as your source of funding the equity that someone has put in the bank, you have the deposits that someone has deposited with you, and then you have the debt that you issue. Is it, can I buy debt? Like can a normal person buy debt? How much, how much does debt cost? Like a bond? Yes, uh, bonds are, uh, are priced. So uh, imagine uh, a bond, if, if I'm uh, raising 100, for instance, uh, I might issue a bond, uh, and the price of that bond might be uh, 100. If it suddenly seems that I'm very unlikely to uh, be able to repay the money that I've borrowed, then, then actually that bond becomes less valuable. So its price will go down. Because simply because people don't believe that I'm going to pay the money back. So a bond which is issued uh, at 100 might go down to 50. And what that means is the, the yield on the bond, how much interest you get for the money that you invest, effectively doubles. And, and that is because people want to get a higher rate of interest for assuming the risk that I'm going to pay them back. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, the, 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 the specific value, you know, let's take the South African bonds, for example. I mean, is, is this... Is this a product that would cost like a hundred euros or a thousand euros or a hundred thousand euros or a million euros? Is, is this something that a normal person can can buy to invest in their uh, retirement? You, you you can invest in um, in bonds for your retirement, and and there are a number of ways of doing it. I, I think the denomination for for bonds is is. Probably the lowest is around about a thousand euros. Some are okay. ten thousand, some are fifty thousand euros. But you can also invest in funds, which themselves invest in bonds. And, and as a, an everyday person on the on the street, that may be an easier way of, uh, of of buying debt and making sure you get a nice spread of of debt rather than buying individual instruments. That's great. So now we know. Now we really do know about equity and debt. Next week on A Dictionary of Finance, we'll have a podcast episode on interest rates, inflation, growth, and employment, which is pretty much all you need to know about everything, isn't it? So please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes so you'll get all the, all the other episodes and let us know what you think about it. You can be in touch with us on Twitter. I'm at EIBMatt, M-A-T-T, and Alar, you are... Uh, it's more complicated than that. I'm at Alar Tankler, A-L-L-A-R-T-A-N-K-L-E-R. -L -L -E Sounds great. So go to at EIB Matt or at Alar Tankler and tell us uh, what financial phrases you'd like to see addressed on future podcasts. If there's something that's really bugging you or something that you're ashamed to admit you don't know about. But in any case, come back to the next one, which is interest rates, inflation, growth and employment. And thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.